um, we've got, we seem to be having a little problem today with the um, chat. We can't seem to get the chat on the uh, regular um, Astro Imaging Channel website, which means it might be harder for you to ask questions. Molly, I think, might have a workaround for us when she starts her presentation, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, I should tell you that we're going to have, um, uh, we've got a set of speakers uh, for all of March set up so far, except for March 24th. And if anybody would like to come in and help us with March 24th, that would really be appreciated. Uh, next week, Ray Graylick is going to be here, and he's going to be talking about PEMPRO and all it can offer for astroimagers, including its uh, periodic correction and its um, and its polar alignment routines and a whole lot of other things. And uh, the week after that would be the 10th, and that would be Ryan Blankenship is going to tell us a little bit more about polar aligning. Remember, I asked last week, and Ryan stepped forward. Uh, he does know Pole Master, so he's going to tell us about that and some other things. And on the 17th, I forget what that is. Actually, I may have these dates messed up a little bit. Let me give me a second here. I'm going to go over to, um, to our uh, other site and check out what the actual schedule is on the upcoming shows. Yeah, the upcoming shows include uh, February 24th is Molly today, the March 3rd is Ray Graylick. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot Michaela. Michaela's March 10th. Uh, she's doing astroimaging on a budget, astroimaging for college students and everybody else who's more sane with their money than the rest of us are. Uh, March 17th is Ryan and that thing about dialing in polar alignment with Pole Master and PhD2. March 31st, Ron Brecher is coming in. That's the week after he does the big show in, in uh, Texas. And if you haven't gotten in on that yet, uh, Ron and Warren are, uh, Warren Keller are doing a show um, that you can get in on. Um, and you might want to check in with them, find out how it's happening. Uh, if you haven't yet, it does cost some money, but it's really worth it. And then March 31st, Ron will be here talking about advanced pixel math and Pix Insight. I know we occasionally have shows on advanced pixel math and Pix Insight. Um, this one's going to be about um, how you can um, uh, work on some gradients and fix some other things and include uh, combining hydrogen alpha with um, uh, LRGB and some other stuff. So even though we have pixel math in various forms at various times on the Astro Imaging Channel, in fact, we're going to have it and um, this is a completely different application of pixel math. It's a very powerful tool and Ron will be here to tell us about it. We are always looking for more presenters and if you've got some expertise, it doesn't have to be the world's most, it knows everything about it, um, but if you know something that you can add to the conversation, please do so. I, um, I'm going to turn it over to Molly. Molly's got a workaround, we think, for the fact that for some reason or another, we can't get the chat room going over in, um, uh, on our regular website. So Molly, if you can take it from here, go ahead. Yeah, sure. So um, I think a good viable option as a backup is to go over to YouTube to watch the stream instead of on the Astro Imaging Channel website. And the easiest way I found to do that is on the Astro Imaging Channel website, which is theastroimagingchannel.com. Um, I'm going to share my screen so I can walk you through this real quick. Um, so the Astro Imaging Channel website here, you scroll down to where the live stream is supposed to be happening, then uh, you can click on the title of the video here, and that will take you to YouTube, and then you can, you can chat here. You may have to log in in order to see this, and depending on whether you've made a channel on YouTube before, which is just getting onto YouTube and favoriting some videos or something like that, um, you may or may not be able to, to actually comment there, but hopefully the majority of people who want to comment will be able to, to access this chat feature. Um, so it's a temporary workaround. We're going to hopefully try and get the button fixed for next week. Oops. Hold on. Uh, okay, yeah. Uh, yeah. So anything else where I dive into my presentation? Go ahead. All right, so I'm Molly Wakeling. I uh, was presented on here back in, I think it was September on uh, astrophotography, uh, like from a newbie's perspective. And I'm gonna present tonight on beginning pics in sight. I've been into astrophotography for about three and a half years. And I just picked up pics in sight back in September and I've been learning it over the past several months. And it's been really awesome to figure out that tool 
it's really, really powerful software. Um, I've been mainly going off of a really fantastic uh, set of tutorials on this website called Light Vortex Astronomy. And I don't have any affiliation with them, just I, ca I came across it. And it's been really helpful to learn PixInsight. They have step-by-step -step tutorials complete with screenshots for every single step so that you don't miss anything. And it's been really helpful. So I'm going to walk through processing an image I took recently. Um, and show the steps to process that image in PixInsight and so sort of some of the basic tools to use to, to do that image processing. So let me get my notes pulled up over here. All right, so the image in question is, let's see, I think it's over on this screen. Let me blow this up here. Um, oh yeah, let me screen share. All right, double check, make sure I'm sharing. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so this is the image here. This is a uh, a wide field of the Orion Nebula region. So we've got uh, the three belt stars here: the Flame Nebula, Horsehead, M42 itself. M78 over here. And this is actually taken from a, a fairly light polluted location. It's about bordel orange, bordel yellow, uh, with, uh, with my Nikon DSLR. I took this back in January with my Nikon D5300 with a 55 to 200 millimeter lens at 85 millimeters, f5.6. It was sitting on my Vixen Polary star tracker. And I got about, uh, I took about 130 two minute long images and 104 of those comprise this image at ISO 1600. Now, from a bordel orange or yellow location, I was really shocked to be able to pull out some of the detail that I was able to pull out in this image, including you can see the witch head nebula over here, which I really did not expect to be able to see from that location. Uh, and there's no, this is an unmodified DSLR. And I didn't use any, I don't have any light pollution filters for it that I can attach to the lens at least. I was able to pull out dark nebula, uh, some of the molecular dust clouds. So um, there's, there's so much you can do with Pixasite that I would never have been able to get this result just using Photoshop. So that's, that was a really exciting result. So uh, my assumptions with this talk are going to be that you're familiar with doing uh, astrophotography processing, maybe with something like Deep Sky Stacker, maybe with some Photoshop in there, that you understand what uh, dark frames are, bias frames. So you've done some astrophotography processing, but you haven't really taken it to the next level yet of something really hardcore like PixInsight. Um, so those are some assumptions I'm going to make here because I don't have enough time to dive into like what are dark frames, what are flats, how do you take them, stuff like that. So I'm going to start from that level. So let me walk around PixInsight a little bit. Um, so you've got all your sort of standard Windows buttons up here. All the processes that you're going to use in PixInsight are located in this processes button. They come in categories, but I haven't really learned where everything is in all the categories. So I just go to this all processes button and you get all the all the processes that are in PixInsight here in an easy way. You can also get them um, over on the side. Let's see, they just recently changed PixInsight a little bit. But yeah, I usually just access them from, from the top up here. Um, the Let's see, let me look at my notes here. So uh, an important button in PixInsight is the screen transfer function button. So a lot of stuff you do in PixInsight, PixInsight happens before you stretch the image, but you need to be able to see what you're doing in order to, to do that. So um, so when I open up an image, like so this, this is one of the raw images that makes up this overall image. Um, it's black and white because I haven't debayered it yet here, where it, it goes from, um, uh, it's like when it's stored in its raw format, the color channels are sort of stored separately. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so that's why it looks black and white here. But actually when I load this, it's really very dark. It's not stretched. You can't see hardly anything in it. So in order to be able to do stuff in PixInsight and be able to see what you're doing, there's this screen transfer function, uh, auto stretch. Now, this doesn't actually, change the picture it's just stretching it so that you can see it on the screen but it's not actually stretching it it's just making it look like look like it's stretched 
just kind of a quick and dirty stretch so you can actually see what you're doing. And this button set, when you open up Pix Insight, is uh, usually up here over on the side, but I drag it down so it's easier to access all the buttons. And it also shows uh, a few other helpful buttons since this is out of the way. Um, so, so I use this one quite a lot. Um, yeah, so and I'll show um, how to kind of do things in Pix Insight as I go around, as I go through showing all of the steps and the processes. So the first thing you need to do is, so since I'm using a DSLR, there is one thing that you need to change in, in Pix Insight before using DSLR images, and that is with the definition of a raw file. It's really easy if you go to Format Explorer over here on the left side, click Raw, and then go to Edit Preferences, and just hit Pure Raw. And that's going to change a bunch of stuff for you, and then hit OK. And then this will let Pix Insight commu like, communicate with raw DSLR images in the correct way so they don't display weird. And um, like if, you, if you're not able to process your DSLR images and things are going wrong, that's probably because you don't have the, uh, uh, the pure raw settings turned on. All right, so, so I'm going to start with batch preprocessor. Now, I usually actually go through and do, um, I, integrate, I, uh, a cal I uh, integrate the biases, make a super bias, calibrate the darks with that, integrate the darks, and then um, do all the image calibration stuff myself because you can tweak the settings a little bit more and also because I had some issues with batch preprocessor previously not working with my DSLR images. But um, that's going to take too much time that I have for this talk, so I'm going to go through batch preprocessor. Plus, it's a lot easier if you're just getting into Pix Insight to start with something that's a little more streamlined. Molly, can we interrupt yeah. you here? Yes. Okay. Tolga's got some news, I think. Tolga, okay. can you... Yeah, I just added the chat on to the main page. So ah. if anybody's on the website, the testing astroimaging.com, and if you refresh your browser, uh, the chat thing should pop up. It, could somebody try it and let me know? Yeah, I see it. Cool. So we're back to norma normality or normalcy Perfect. or the way it's supposed to be. Um, that's good. Thank you very much, Tolga. And no, no while problem. we're at it, let's see. I think um, Amiko asked, uh, do you, or is this a modified um, DSLR? And I think you've answered that it is, in fact, modified. It's not modified. It is not modified. OK. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have no idea where I am. I've got three screens showing, but I think we're <laughs> ready to proceed. Right, everybody? Let's go. All right. Thanks, Tolga. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, okay, so let me um, hop back over. So there's diff you have uh, four workspaces available to you in Pix Insight, so you can kind of have multiple screens going at once. I don't usually use that feature, but it's handy here for when I have some images that are preloaded. Um, so yes, so there's two there's two kinds of, of uh, ways to do things in Pix Insight. There are processes and there are scripts. Usually the scripts, I think, are things that uh, are being tested and they haven't been fully implemented in Pix Insight yet. And because every once in a while, a script will then become a process as it's been fully fleshed out. Um, but the batch preprocessing one is quite widely used. So if you go to batch processing and then batch preprocessing, then you'll be able to open up that script. Now, when you have a script open, you can't access anything else. So usually when, with a process, you can have multiple processes open at once. But with a script, you can only have that script open. And you can't, I can't like go open any other processes here. Um, so anything you need to do to your images before getting to this step, you'll need to not have this window open. Now, usually when I'm doing, when I'm not doing batch preprocessing, then I go through the subframe selector process, which lets, which does the, so you know how like in um, Deep Sky Stacker, it, you can let it choose which images are the best ones to be able to process. That's pretty much what you're doing in subframe selector, only you have the control to decide which images are going to be included, and you can weight them so that when you go to integrate them, the better ones have a higher weighting in that integration. And better is in like um, tighter stars, less noise, things like that. So uh, I've already gone through, and I did that process previously because I'm not going to have time to go through that tonight. And I have my best 104 of 127 original images. And I've already found which one is the best, gets the highest score to use as my reference frame for registration. So the first thing to do is you're gonna add your lights, your darks, and your biases. So I'm gonna go add my lights. 
back out my folder here. So approved is, is the folder where um, I have all the ones that uh, made it through subframe selector. These ones didn't get renamed like they normally do because I uh, pulled them from a different place. But um, yeah, so I'm going to open up all my lights. And then I'm going to go to add darks. Let me deselect my. So if you have a master dark that you use um, consistently, like you've already integrated it previously and you want to use it over again because you're using the same exposure and same temperature, then you can choose your master dark and you can just check the use master dark button here and it will use it as the master and not, not try to integrate it. That's the same for flat and bias. Um, but for, for the sake of of uh, this process, I'm gonna go ahead and add all the darks, assuming you haven't made a master dark yet. And then master bias, or sorry, with biases, do the same thing. Go to my biases folder, you select the masters I generated previously. All right, now this process takes a little bit to do, so I'm not gonna actually execute it here. I'm gonna do uh, the thing where I uh, pretend like I execute it, like, you know, on a cooking show where you put the cookies in the oven and you pull out the cookies that are already baked from the other oven. I'm going to do that a lot tonight. So uh, I will step through some of the settings here, though, real quick. So um, the Light Vortex Astronomy tutorial recommends that if you have fewer than 10 frames, so like you're looking at your biases here, for example, you have fewer than 10 frames, you're going to want to use average sigma clipping for your rejection algorithm. Now, um, rejection algorithm is what's going to reject um, like hot pixels and in your light, so it's gonna reject satellite trails and things like that, things that, um, that shouldn't be showing up in your images. Um, if you do 10 to 20 frames, if you have 10 to 20 frames, you're gonna use Windsorized sigma clipping. So I have 20 bias frames, so I'm actually gonna choose Windsorized sigma clipping. If you have more than 20 frames, you're going to choose linear fit clipping. Now, uh, I have 100 darks, but my laptop only has 16 gigabytes of RAM only, quote unquote. Uh, PixInsight is, is a not excellent at managing resource, computer resources at this time, at least not that I've experienced. So I had to actually trim down to about 40 darks to be able to not have it run out of memory. Now, I also had several Chrome windows open, so I could have done myself a favor and closed some of those. Or we started my computer to clear out the RAM so I could do a few more dark frames. So keep your computer resources in mind when you're using PixInsight because it will use all of them. All right. Um, yeah, so I, I choose uh, linear fit clipping for the darks. I didn't have flats with this data set. I haven't taken flats with uh, just the camera lens before. Um, I usually, the, the vignetting's not too bad with the camera lens, so I just usually crop out the edges. And I've got my lights here. Now, a couple of things to note with the lights. So these are DSLR images. So I'm going to need to check this CFA images box over here on the right uh, so that I can tell PixInsight that they are one-shot color camera images. So this is true if you have a DSLR or a one-shot color camera like the DWO ASI 1600MC, for exam example. That's our one-shot color. You'll need to tick the CFA images box. If you do that, it will illuminate the debayer box here. Uh, debayering is, uh, again, where you have those individual uh, raw color channels, those get put together. Nikons and, and Canons use this RGGB format of debayering. Uh, you can go Google what the, what the uh, pattern is for yours, or you can just hit auto. Leave the debayer method on BNG. Um, I'd uncheck drizzle because my images are 24 megapixels, and generating drizzle data is going to make them so large I'm going to run out of hard drive space, so I'm going to leave that one unticked. And I don't want to actually integrate them at this stage. There's some tweaking you want to do to the image integration, so I'm going to leave the image integration box unticked as well. Uh, so basically what, what this process will do is it will integrate your darks and, and calibrate them with your integrated bias, and then it will calibrate your lights with, with those darks and, and those biases. So we'll do all the calibration for you. It will register them for you. And then it will um, 
debayer them for you. Finally, for the registration, you have to choose a registration frame. Usually you want to do your highest scoring frame, which if you do subframe selector, you can get that information. Or if, you're, if you really don't know, I would just scroll through and look for the one with the tightest stars and the least number of clouds in it. I know from doing this previously that that image for me is DSC number 172. So I'm going to pick that. And then I'm going to choose an output directory. I created one here called batch preprocess. I select that. And then I would hit run. I'm going to not hit run because this will take, I think it took about, what did I say, half an hour previously to, to work. So I don't want to take up all that time. OK, time um, out, time out. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's go to back to some questions that are in the chat room here. If you don't OK. Wonder. This is a logical time to do it while it's while your cookies are in the oven or whatever you were talking about, a baking show. You know, I've never <laughs> been on a baking show, so I didn't know what you were talking about. <laughs> Okay, um, El Miko, uh, there you guys were talking about char recharging the desiccant, and that's cool, but it's not about this. So we'll, we'll just, uh, El Miko says he just got Pix Insight in December and likes it, um, and asks, what's the repository? And I really don't know what the repository is. Can anybody yeah, answer that? Actually, so I just read, uh, I just saw an email from uh, from Pix Insight, I think the other day, that they're putting Pix, uh, most of Pix Insight up on a GitHub repository. So users will be able to actually go and modify algorithms um, to, to like try and, and make new features. And um, if you're not familiar with GitHub, it's a way to um, for like mass people to, to edit code that's being controlled by like the, um, uh, the people who work at, at the company that makes Pix Insight, so that when, when people make new features, then these can be added in. Okay, um, I so, don't, yeah. so El Miko asking what repository is, we can pretty much tell him that since he got this thing in December, he doesn't need to worry about it for another month before he starts changing <laughs> the code up there, right? Okay, uh, the other yeah. thing he says, the other thing he's and, and if you're asking which version I'm running, then I'm on 1.8.6, whatever the update was that came out last week. <laughs> okay, and um, Almeco's always getting the, the, the there. They do update the program regularly, Almeco. And yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, if you keep getting it, it's because for some reason you're not installing the update. And so, if you didn't, uh, you know, get the go up there, get the update, install it, and then uh, yeah, it'll keep reminding you to go do that. So you might want to go ahead and, and update it um and oh, take yes. it from there um howdy bobster hi everybody how you doing hey good to see you everybody so I just, to just, just elaborate on that a little bit there are two types of updates there are updates that you can just install by clicking that little up dot yes. update yeah. icon but there are some updates that you really have to go uh download the new version that is mm -hmm. correct on the website and install it yeah so i just got 1.8.6 i think it came out about a month ago and I had to uninstall 1.8.5 to get 1.8.6, and I had to get a new license key, which was just a matter of emailing them, and they emailed me a new license key. It was super easy. Um, so, uh, yeah, so there are two kinds of updates. Um, and the, when they send out the email saying, hey, the new update's ready, they'll tell you whether, um, whether it's the like, one you have to uninstall the previous version for or not. Um, and then Steve asks how you picked your best um, – uh, best image. I think you might have explained it later. Uh, he wants to know if you used full width half max or signal to noise oh, yeah. ratio. What criteria do you use? So um, the Light Vortex Astronomy website has a really handy um, weighted algorithm. Uh, I don't have it handy, but it's it's in their section about subframe selector in in the tutorials. Um, let's see. I think I've got it open here. So on the Light Vortex Astronomy site under their tutorials, if you go to, um, I think it's, um, yeah, pre-processing images in Pixinsight, they have a section on subframe selector. And they have a function in there that has uh, a way to weight, to calculate weighted scores uh, that's based on full width half max, eccentricity, and um, Oh, what's the third characteristic? Uh, and on, and on, there's a third one that I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, and then I look at the score, which is a weighting of all, of all three of these factors. And then I choose which one has the highest score to be my reference frame. Okay. So it, it's a combination of things and, and you're getting it out of a, a script there. The uh, Eric wanted to point out that the script that you were referring to earlier has become a process. The script is still available. 
I think I got that right, Eric. Maybe you can. Yes, yeah, subframe selector is now is now a process. Yes, it, yeah. it, uh, as of like the update that came out last week, and it's significantly changed from the last time I, I used it. So I'm gonna uh, have to relearn that a little bit. I couldn't get the plot to show up earlier, but uh, luckily the Light Vortex Astronomy website is very up to date. As soon as updates come out, he's already rewritten the whole thing. So um, you can. Uh, be assured that 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 one is up to date. <laughs> uh, Steve has given us a link to something, but I don't. Uh, I don't. I. It's kind of hard to follow for me because I'm trying to do too many things at once. I don't know what it's a link to. Uh, Steve, maybe you can tell us or something. GitLab. Is that? Uh, is that with the repository? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I think we've been through all the questions that came from tonight. We've still got some questions hanging around from last week up there, and maybe we'll get to them <laughs> a little bit later. Yeah. Yeah. Molly, you mentioned something about uh, Master Dark. Uh, when you yeah. use some um, batch, pr batch preprocessor, mm -hmm. the Master Dark is Master Bias calibrated. Is that correct? Um, yeah, uh, or so, if you so, don't know, that's fine. But I just want to know. Um, so, so when I do it by hand, I calibrate the darks with the bias, um, and I, that's a procedure I follow from Light Vortex Astronomy. Batch preprocessor. I don't know if it if it if that master dark is calibrated or not. Um, I'd have to go read a little deeper into batch free processing. So that, that was my question. That's okay if you don't know. I just did. um. I, I don't know it either. I'm I'm just caught. Yeah, that I up. I don't know. I don't know. I'd have to go look at that. Okay, Molly. Yeah, because it does it does generate those darks and biases for you. Correct. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Molly. Uh, yes. There's one other thing in the uh, pre processing uh, script. Cosmetic correction is probably a worthwhile thing to kind of read up on and to do. And I've, I've looked into it. I have not noticed. A, I don't have a whole lot of cosmic rays or um, hot pixels in my DSLR, and I haven't, or in my ZWO, and I've not really used it. Um, the couple times I have used it, I didn't really notice a difference. But um, a lot of people, I think people who use CCD cameras benefit from that much more than people with CMOS cameras. Uh, but yes, the light vortex astronomy does walk you through that. Cosmetic correction is really worthwhile. It can also yeah. get rid of some bad columns in case you have that as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I didn't include that here either, but it uh, definitely can be part of that image processing process and uh, help take care of hot pixels and um, bad columns and stuff like that, especially for the CCD users. It may also, it's probably also helpful for CMOS. All right. Anything else at this time? I'm good. Alrighty, I'm gonna press on. So uh, I pulled the uh, already baked cookies out of the oven here, and um, let's see. Let me, before I go to that, so um, so Blink is a tool you can use to quickly look at at multiple images. Now it is limited to how much RAM your computer has, so I can't load all 100 at once. I usually load 20 or 30 at a time. Here I've got um, about 20. And I can quickly play through and make sure that my image is registered correctly, um, see if there's any weird anomalies. Um, but these look these look pretty normal, so it's stepping through showing these. It's a, a little slow at the moment. There it goes. You can see that I have a satellite that, or an airplane or something that goes through, uh, and a satellite as well. So this looking at these first 20, um, I can tell the process went correctly. Sometimes I've had some issues where things get really wacko. Um, so it's a quick and easy way for me to see that that the Im images are good here. Uh, so that's what they look like after they've been calibrated and debayered and registered. Uh, so the next step is image integration. So I'm going to pop back over to this workspace. So image integration is your stacking process. So that, I just go to all processes, image integration. Let me reset this. Uh, so a, a quick note on the buttonology of PixInsight. So there's some buttons along the bottom. They're going to be your action buttons. So um, I don't know how well you can. I need like a little um, mouse highlighter thing installed. But uh, in the lower right-hand corner of most windows is this reset button. So if you just want to reset it all back to default, then that's where that button's going to come in handy. These two buttons over here on the left, the circle one is apply global. Sometimes there'll be a square one for apply, which is when you're applying to a single image. In this case, the image integration process is something that applies to many images, so there's just the apply global button. And then there's this new instance button. 
which I'll show some examples of later. Um, you can use that to save processes to be used later on or to be used completely later, like in a um, like with a different image or if you're going to go back and reprocess stuff. That's where that button comes in handy. And I'll show an example of, of using that later on. So um, I'm going to hit Add Files. And I'm going to go to my batch pre-processed, registered. So for every step, Pixinsight puts a, a, a suffix after the name of your image. So, you can, so C means calibrated, D means debayered, and R means registered. So those are the ones I want. I select all of those. Um, go to my notes here. All right, so um, following the light vortex astronomy tutorial, I haven't played around with a whole lot of the different options here, so I just kind of take, take the recommendation. I use average in combination. Um, there's a procedure where you can do this local normalization that's supposed to help with normalizing frame to frame. It's, I have not gotten it to work yet, so um, I'll have to keep playing with that. So in, in, in lieu of local normalization, I select additive. Um, since I did not do subframe selector in this instance for weights, I'm going to do noise evaluation. But ordinarily, if I do subframe selector, I'm going to do fits keyword. And um, so I'm not going to go into that tonight. But uh, that's what lets me use that scoring I mentioned earlier to to weight uh, which photos are going to take more precedence in the stacking process. I'm going to leave the evaluate noise box checked. Down here in pixel rejection, um, because I have over 100 images, which is well over 20, I'm going to choose linear fit clipping. And again, following light vortex astronomy tutorial recommendations, I'm going to uncheck clip low range, leave clip low pixels, and clip high pixels checked. Um, now, if you're using sigma clipping, so if you have fewer than 20 frames or if you decide to use sigma clipping, then there's some more options you're going to want to care about which is in pixel rejection two, which is sigma low and sigma high. And those you can move to, to like uh, if you're still seeing satellite trails or if you're still seeing a lot of hot pixels, you can adjust those. Um, I could adjust linear fit low, and linear fit high. And the easy way to do that would be instead of integrating all 100 of my pictures, because it takes a minute, um, do like 10 and see, see if, if it's working the way that I want it to adjust those and then try again. Um, all right, so this one also takes a long time. <clears throat> it took about half an hour to accomplish on my laptop. It's a little bit faster on my beefcake desktop with a with a beefier processor. Um, but so I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna put my unbaked cookies in the oven and pull out the baked ones immediately from the oven next door and close out of this process and show you what the result was. So this is the integrated frame. So you can see that uh, due to registration, I've got dark edges here where um, uh, my mount wasn't tracking perfectly. So I do have some dark edges. I can. It'll also give you the uh, the rejected pixels, so you can see what exactly it's rejecting. Now, if I zoom in on mine, you can see it's actually rejecting kind of the edges of stars. So I could go in and adjust some values. I ended up not uh, for the sake of time because it did take. A half an hour to process, so I'm just going to roll with it. Now, um, when, you, when it first comes out, it's actually going to look like this. It's going to be black because it's still not stretched. So that's where this screen transfer auto stretch comes into play. Because now I can I can look at this image and keep processing it, but without applying the actual stretch to it until later. There's a lot of functions in PixInsight that work better with these linear state images, pre-stretched linear before they become stretched, where they become nonlinear, where there's other functions that work better on the nonlinear images. All right, so next I'm going to crop this image uh, to get rid of those dark edges. So when I'm zooming in and out here with the scroll wheel. Um, so if I go to process and I'm going to do dynamic crop. Um, so I'm going to hit, so by, so when this is open, you can see I still can't do anything on this image. You have to hit the reset button, and that's like the initialize button. So then I can just take and drag the corners or the edges to 
get it off of the both the vignetted and the registration separation here on the edge. Um, now, normally what I like to do is if I need to go back some steps and or maybe I want to reprocess it a different way and I've already got stuff generated for the cropped image, I want to be able to crop, crop it the same way. So this is where I'm going to go to this new instance button and click and drag it to the screen before I hit the execute button. So I click and drag the new instance button and that creates an, an, an instance of this with all of these settings. If I right click on it, I can rename it, so I can set, I can click set icon identifier, and I can change it, I can change its name here, and I can right click on it and hit save selected icons, and I can save this in a folder to use later. Um, now because I have a few more cookie baking steps, um, I'm going to actually delete this and close out of this crop. So when you're, when you're ready to apply, you hit the execute button. I'm going to close out of that crop, open up the crop that I had earlier, and hit go. And then I can close that. So I saved out this process from when I was doing this earlier so that I could apply the same crop as I did before um, so I can not have images that are cropped slightly different messing up my process here. All right, so next step. As you can see, the background is very green. And it's time to get rid of that. So that green, I think, largely comes from the fact that there's two green pixels for uh, for the red and the blue pixels. And for daytime exposures, that's fine. But for nighttime exposures, you get a lot of that, that green showing up. So I'm going to use my probably my favorite process in PixInsight so far, which is dynamic background extraction, the holy grail of PixInsight. So I just go to, actually, it's in background modelization up here at the top. Now, there is an automatic background extraction process. Uh, I haven't, every time I've tried it, I've gotten some pretty weird results. So um, I'll just go with the dynamic background extraction. So again, you have to hit the reset button to initialize it. So there's a couple settings here to pay attention to, and there is a little bit of fussing that you have to do. So um, first thing is I'm going to go down here to default sample radius and Light Vortex Astronomy Tutorial suggests to use something around the range of, of 10 pixels to get a nice sample area. If you're in a very star dense area with some with a wide field of view, then you may want to you may need to actually decrease your default sample radius. If you're in a star poor area, you can increase that radius some more. Um, there's different effects you can get with changing the radius that I haven't fully explored yet. And then uh, you can do like 12 to 50, like the more samples per row will help you get a better model. So I usually do 12. And then because I know I have some badly vignetted corners, I'm going to have to increase the tolerance a little bit um, to around two. And I hit generate, and it's going to generate a whole bunch of X uh, marks here for me that actually are small boxes, as you may or may not actually be able to see here. Uh, so you can see it didn't put any in the corner, so I need to increase the tolerance even a little more, and then I'll just have to add a couple of points. All right, so now that I have this generated, I'm going to decrease the tolerance a little bit for viewing purposes, and I don't want to regenerate the points. I'm just going to hit resize all. All right, so this is where this is probably the the most like hands-on, time-consuming process in uh, in PixInsight that I've come across so far with maybe the exception of dynamic PSF and subframe selectors. So um, what you have to do is you have to check each one of these points to make sure it's not sitting on any stars. You don't want any stars underneath of these points. So as I click each one, see, I may need to, there we go. Okay, so the image that is showing here in this little box is inverted, so it's really easy to see the stars. This box is showing the whole size of, your, of the sample box. So there's a star there. So I'm going to click and drag this guy to an area. This might be hard. There we go. An area that doesn't have any stars that's nearby. Uh, I'm not going to do that for every point here because, again, that would take a while. So I'm going to pull up one that I did earlier today. Zoom back out. There we go. So the cool thing is you can save just, just in the same way with crop. You can you click and drag the new instance button and save this dynamic background extraction process 
with everything, with all the settings, all the, all the work that you've done, you can save it and you can reopen it back up to apply to, uh, to that image again. Um, so looks like I missed one here. See that star there in the corner? I got to zoom in and grab it. The point, the point you're currently on, um, I changed the color so I could see it better against the screen background, but it'll be highlighted a different color. There we go. Okay. All right. Now I'm going to hit the execute button. Uh, oh, one more thing I forgot to mention is here in the correction section, you're going to want it, which is under target image correction. You're going to want to choose subtraction to actually be able to do the subtraction. For for big gross backgrounds like that, you want to do subtraction. For if you if you have gradients, I hear that doing division can be better, um, especially on the second time. If you if you do dynamic background extraction a second time, um, you just kind of have to play and tweak with that. So again, you see that it's very dim. That's because it's it's still linear at this point. I have not stretched it, so I'm going to put an auto stretch on there so I can get a look at it. Oh, look at that! That is so beautiful. So already, but even before I've really done a whole lot. Um, I've got tons of background. I've got lots of dust. I've got the witch head nebula over here. Um, I've got some some really like a whole lot of exposure on uh, M42 here and the flame and horse head nebula over here. Now, obviously, there's still some color correction and some denoising that needs to be done, but we're already in a really good spot here. So um, this was really exciting when I was processing this the first time to see this result come out. Um, all right, so are there any other questions so far before I move on? Let's take a look at YouTube here. I've got to get my mic back on. The mic wasn't okay. on. Molly, um, I have a couple yeah. of comments. Go ahead, Eric. Uh, when, when you save another instance and you want to name it, no spaces mm -hmm. are allowed um, in, in the naming. And that drove me crazy for about a week. <laughs> yeah, so so Pixinsight is pretty close to code, and um, if you've ever coded before, you know that spaces are bad, and you know that special characters can be dicey, and uh, you can't like start stuff with numbers in certain blank programming code, programming languages, and stuff like that. So as a habit, I've I've already I've gotten very much in the habit of using underscores and dashes and stuff like that to instead of spaces. That's just sort of a habit I've already developed. Um, but yeah, so keep in mind that um, a lot of stuff in Pixside does not, allow, does not allow spaces. Those are a protected character to mean stuff in other places. So underscores is usually a good way to get around that because you can't use dash either most of the time because in pixel math, for instance, dash means subtraction. And if you have an image with a dash in its name, then it would be confused. So. Um, and it'll it'll tell you if you can't use it. It just won't let you name it. So, um, yeah, underscores are, are good, so, safe bet. So the other thing that you might want to mention when you go through this process is the photometric color calibration. Process. I'm doing that next. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we've got a we had a discussion going on. Uh, let me see if I can separate it out. Um, a couple of guys talking about full width app max and the clouds and things. And NGC 1535 wants to make sure that everybody understands that the processes uh, done by way of uh, uh, batch pre-processing and the processes done by way of manual pre-processing, uh, whenever they use exactly the same mathematics and the same assumptions, they come up with the same results. Uh, there are, as has been pointed out in that argument over there that um, it may be that you can use, you get other benefits from using batch pre-processing. And I believe that there are also benefits you can get from manual pre-processing if you have particularly difficult data. But um, I've got a microphone, so I don't mean to, you know, um, I don't think that there's a whole lot of difference for most people uh, between batch and manual and many, many, many imagers, as Tolga points out, just swear by batch pre-processing. And yeah. I've, I've seen it said over and over again. So um, yeah, uh, then, oh, um, uh, let's see, there was one up there. I one thing that's through. helpful for manual pre-processing that you can do with batch pre-processing is um, if you do some of the work, like if you make your own, um, so if, if, when you make, when you do biases in, 
batch preprocessor, it will integrate the biases, but it does not make a super bias. So mm -hmm. if, uh, if you want to use a super bias, you, you can do that yourself and then use that in batch preprocessor. Right. Um, so there's a you can do kind of like a partial, like some manual processing, some batch preprocessor. Um, and like same with local normalization, you have to generate those first, which requires you to do some manual work beforehand. Right. And and I don't think that in batch preprocessing, while you have a lot of options as to as to how you manipulate the data and which algorithms you use to do things, I think you get have even more over in the manual preprocessing, which is where it yeah. comes in handy for the for the tricky things. Um, Mitch, I think was it was asking, how do you fix ransack error? Can't find enough punitive punitive, I think it is, stars mm -hmm. to to register. Yeah, so there's a note on on ransack uh, ransack parameters in light light vortex astronomy and what to do if if um, registration is failing. Uh, I haven't had that particular error happen to me before, so I don't know offhand. But um, uh, it's it's talked about in Light Vortex Astronomy, um, and there's probably some other resources for it online too. But I I haven't experienced yeah. that myself yet, I've, so I've had I'm not that sure. happen. I've had that happen, uh, and th that's one drawback of batch pre preprocessing. Well, you throw you know like every filter in there. Which very convenient, you know. You throw every filter in there, every dark bias flat, and yeah. it'll sort out which yeah. one goes with it yeah. and do that. But then, in the like on the second filter, if it runs into a error, ransack error, it will just stop the whole process. And then, you know, so half of your data got done and half of it didn't. Uh, you don't know where it ended, and so I don't know. Yeah, I, it, it could probably depend on, um, you know, if, I mean, if you have really, really good data to start with, then batch preprocessing can save you a lot of time. If your data is sort of difficult, like if your stars, if your stars are not um, very round, I, I've noticed in Deep Sky Stacker, sometimes Deep Sky Stacker has some real trouble with stars that are that are a little bit too oblong, and sometimes I have to force it by forcing it to do drizzle in order to, um, uh, in, in order to no, not just in order, have it do um what was it super pixel or something like that I, I kind of have to force it by playing around with the settings a bit um it's probably a little bit easier to do in pix and site because you can actually mess with the registration parameters which you can't do in deep sky stacker um not not very much at least um but yeah if you have nice clean data then doing batch preprocessor can can make that easy but sometimes you have to go tweak stuff yourself Okay, let's see. Uh, Almeco points out that if you have multiple imaging nights on a target, manual comes in handy because uh, if you take separate flats for each session, it's, it's in Actually, you can handle in. that in batch preprocessor yeah. as well. Um, if you go to, um, and I, I uh, haven't really played with this a whole lot yet, but if you go to add, add files instead of like lights, flats, darks, you can actually um, create your own. Okay, well, it's not gonna work from here, but you can create your own labels for stuff, and you can you can um, connect those like it, it it'll like if you have a um, like night one or red filter or stuff like that, you can have it connect those things together, and then it will do all that work for you. Same way for processing lRGB images all at once in batch preprocessor. Hmm. So that's how if you have different different temperatures, different uh, different flats, different filters, it can handle all those different kinds of things. Uh, okay, I think we got another discussion going on out there, but I think we're cool <laughs> to continue, Molly. All right, cool. Um, yeah, we're, this is uh, going, going pretty quick time here, so let me, uh, let me start speeding up here a bit. Okay, um, so yeah, I'm going to close out of DBE. Uh, let me see. close. Okay, all right. So uh, the next step I'm going to do, um, so a lot of people do background neutralization at some point. I was just uh, flipping through Warren Keller's Inside Pix Insight book that I just got, and he recommends not doing background neutralization before doing color calibration. I'm just, I'm just going to jump into color calibration. Um, so in the last, I think at 1.8.5 or sometime recently, they added this amazing algorithm called photometric color calibration that has just blown my mind. It's my other favorite algorithm in, uh, in Pix Insight. So in, what this does is it plate solves your image, finds a G2V, which is a sun-like star, 
and uses that as your white reference because uh, really what you want in a lot of in your in your you know uh, in your regular color astro images as opposed to your uh, narrow band ones in your in your normal color wide band astro images you want them to look like how they would look to the human eye and using the sun as a white reference or a sun like star is a really good way to do that so that's exactly what photometric color calibration does so the first thing i'm going to do let me hit reset here so since it needs to plate solve you have to give it a couple of parameters so I hit the search coordinates button, and you can actually just type in the name of, like the catalog name of the target. That is, it doesn't have to be in the middle of your image, just somewhere near the middle. So I did M42, and I hit search, and it goes and grabs the coordinates for M42. I hit get, and it fills those in, the right ascension and declination. Uh, I don't really mess with the observation date. It hasn't really, I, I haven't had any problems plate solving just by leaving it at the default. Then you got to give it your focal length. So I used, and it's in millimeters. So I used an 85, I had my lens set at 85 millimeters. The pixel pitch on my Nikon D8300, I'm sorry, D5300 is 3.89 microns. Uh, let's see, most of these I leave at default. There's a couple different options of what you can do for like, okay, that white, that white reference star, what is that going to be white reference for? And you can choose these different profiles here. I just use average spiral galaxy. And that seems to get me pretty good color uh, most of the time. Uh, yeah, I leave everything else at default, including the background neutralization section. And I hit go. Now it's going to take about 30 seconds here, I think. Hopefully this wasn't the long one. All right, this one took about a minute and a half. So I'm just going gonna, gonna to abort this process. It's not really a boring, is it? Okay, well, we're in for the we're in for a minute here. <laughs> um, so sometimes, like earlier today, I had a uh, plate solving error. You can see it's getting a couple errors here, and I switched the server from I had it on Cambridge. I switched it to uh, to France, and that worked. I don't really know why. Um, sometimes I'll just go tweak something, and it, it, sometimes I'll just try again, and it'll work the second time. I don't know. Sometimes it has trouble plate solving. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, but when it does plate solve, the result I got out of that earlier today was this guy. So now you can see that the colors look much more normal, um, not quite as blue. You get, I'm getting some of the reds back, like up here in the horse head nebula. Um, so it's starting to look more, more natural, more like how you expect it to look. All right, so that's it for photometric color calibration. I'm gonna close out of that. Molly, can I yeah. add one thing to the photometric color calibration? Go for it. If, if you have an issue with plate solving, which happens sometimes, the easiest way around that is to open up your reference image, your original FITS file, mm -hmm. and have it take the information from that file. And since that's your reference image, you don't have to plate solve it. It'll just pick it up from the FITS file. Do you have to? Um, do you have to? Do you have to crop that image first, or are you talking about one nope. that you uploaded to astrometry? Just whatever one you pick for a reference. Just open it up and just say uh -huh. get the get the lo location. Get everything from that file. Oh, okay. And, I see. and you'll have perfect. Uh, you won't Eric, have to let me just throw a caveat in there. That only works if you're program is connected to your mount yeah because like my i don't get um my my ra and deck are not saved in my uh in my fits images because right um i don't have uh i don't have my my program connected to my mount i just I, the only thing connected to my mount is plate solving so or sorry not plate solving um guiding uh so i'm hoping to get to that at some point because that'd be really handy but uh yeah i don't i don't have coordinates in my images now you can upload it to astrometry and get an image that has coordinates in it, and that might help that process. I haven't tried it yet though. All right, um, okay. So now that I've done the color calibration, I'm gonna do some denoising. Now there was some debate recently on here as to whether it's better to do, uh, to do the denoising before or after stretching. 
And I've, I've been doing it before and it's, I've been getting really good results out of it. I think you can also do it after. Um, I, ha I was gonna experiment with that today, but ran out of time. Um, so that's something I'll have to experiment with or you can experiment with and, uh, and let us know what you think. But I'm gonna go ahead and do it now because that's worked really well for me in the past. So I, I like to use multi-scale linear transform for this stage of denoising. It works well on either linear or non-linear images. Now, before you do the multi-scale linear transform, it would behoove you to make a mask. So the so when you do denoising, like in Photoshop, for example, using the uh, uh, camera raw CC algorithm, for instance, it basically is applying a blurring algorithm over the entire image. And blurring will reduce the appearance of noise, but it will also blur out the fine details in your nebula or your galaxies. And as you can see, the high signal areas tend to be the less noise. Those aren't your problem. Those aren't your noisy areas most of the time. So you, if you protect those where all your detail is, and then, uh, tar then you can target your low signal areas or your background here uh, without, without sacrificing the detail on your target. So a quick and dirty way to do that is just to make a, a luminance mask. So I'm going to minimize this for a second. So the way to do that is I'm just gonna go to channel extraction. So channel management, channel extraction. I'm gonna choose CIE, LAB image type and uncheck the A and the B boxes and just have the luminance or the lightness box checked. Hit apply. It's gonna generate a luminance image for me. Now, it doesn't, the mask doesn't work if you don't stretch this mask image. So let me take that back off of there. There's a quick and dirty way to do that too without having to do much work. So if you open up the screen transfer function process, instead of the little buttons I've been pushing up here, click on the image, click the reset button, and then hit the nuclear button over here. It will, it will stretch it for you just like the buttons up here did. And then you open up a histogram transformation process. And we'll come back to this process later when we actually do the actual stretching on the main image. Um, so what I, so now, so I've, I've hit the nuclear button. It has a solution for me. I click and drag the new instance button over to the bottom of the histogram transfer window. And it copies that information over to the histogram window. And now I hit reset on the screen transfer function window to get it back to the linear state, close it out, and then I hit apply in the histogram transformation window. This applies a permanent stretch. So no longer is it a screen stretch, this has actually changed the data in the image from linear to non-linear, which we'll be doing here soon with stretching. So I'll close out of that. I'm gonna re, so you can rename an image by right clicking on the little tab here on the edge, hit identifier, and I'm gonna call it, um, luminance mask. Again, you can't do spaces here. Hit OK. Minimize. Um, sorry. Minimize that. OK. To apply the mask, mask, select mask. Sorry. You have to click on the image you want to apply it to. Mask, select mask, and luminance mask. Um, now, I want to, I'm hitting invert here, and you'll see why in a second. That's because the red areas are protected and the less red areas are, um, are gonna be what's targeted. So you can see there's a lot, it, it did pick up all of the noise here. So far that hasn't been too much of a problem, but you can go in and you can tweak the histogram stretch when you're actually stretching this image to include less of that by clipping the low end and, and things like that. But this is just a real quick and dirty way to do that. Um, all right, so back to multi-scale linear transform. Now we have our mask. I'm going to, uncheck show masks so that we can see what we're doing here better. The mask is still there, it's just not displaying it right now. So, um, so basically what multi-scale linear transform is, is it's, it's doing a wavelet deconvolution, or sorry, a wavelet transformation on, uh, wavelet denoising, excuse me, on this image here. And you've got these different layers, and this is referring to the scale of the noise. So. The first layer here is, so we're looking at, at the most common type of noise, which is uh, one pixel scale noise. So if I zoom in, you can see a lot of the noise is sort of single pixel in size. The next layer is, is two pixels, and then four pixels, eight, and then residual is everything larger than that in, in multiples of two. 
Um, again, following the um, Light Vortex Astronomy tutorial suggestion, I've, I've created, I use this, I, save, I, I have saved out this multi-scale linear transform um, process, and I use it over and over again because it works so well. Where you have, so threshold is basically the aggressiveness of the denoising, and amount is how much you are blending the denoised and the, and the non-denoised image together. So that website recommends for layer one, threshold of three, amount half, 50%. Layer two, threshold of two, amount 50%. Layer three, threshold of, of one, amount 50%. Layer four, threshold of a half. So basically you're getting less aggressive as you're getting to the larger noise structures. Um, I've left everything else at, at its default. There's so many things you can tweak in Pix and Sight, but you know, just I, I'm still, you know, now that I've got my workflow figured out, I may start tweaking with these a little bit more, but we're just gonna roll with this. So I'm going to hit apply. And it's gonna take about 30 seconds to do. Um, so if you if you uh, so a way to be able to experiment with this is you can actually make a preview window. So if if my buttons were active here, uh, the preview the make preview window button is one of these ones up here. <laughs> They've rearranged a little bit. Um, yeah, new preview. Then I can click and drag that over, and then I can work on just a small section of the image, which will operate much faster, and then I can see how the denoising goes. So I'm gonna zoom back in. I don't know, don't know how good the video quality is, but uh, if you were sitting where I am, you can see that the small scale noise, that pixel by pixel noise, has just gone away. So let me, let me undo. See it there before and after. So it's made a huge difference, all while protecting the fine detail that is in the nebula. All right, so I gotta get moving on here, so I'm gonna go ahead and close out of that. All right, it's finally time to stretch. Now I also tend to do deconvolution at this point. That's like a whole talk on its own. Um, so I might do that at a future one. Uh, the Light Vortex Astronomy tutorial has a great tutorial on how to do deconvolution and not get all the de-ringing that, that it's notorious for. Um, can cover that on another night. All right, Molly. Yeah. Molly, while yeah. we're here, before we go on, um, um, on MSLT, how do you save yeah. the parameters? All right, so um, so I have it open here, and I click and drag just like before the new instance button down to the workspace, and I can change the name, and I can also hit save selected icons, and I can save it out, and then hit the save button here, and then uh, when I when I bring that, I can. Uh, Literally just click and drag that back into, into PixInsight and I'll have it ready to use. I can open it up and apply it to whatever image I'm using. And, and you might, might uh, point out um, of how you can save your icon sets and things like that. Uh, you can load an icon set or save an icon set and all that other stuff too. So I've not actually done that and I probably but should you, at some point. Just, sometimes I go back and reprocess. Uh, yeah, I think if you go if you go up under process, you can grab it and do it. Okay. Um, process. Process yeah, icons. Yeah, save process icons. There you go. It's right there. Yeah, and that, that'll <laughs> save all those icons as you develop them. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. Okay. Move on from there. Stretching. Yes. Okay. So stretching, I'm gonna go ahead and take off my screen stretch because we're about to do this for real. So processes, histogram transformation. Now, whenever you open, if you, in whatever current instance of Pix Insight you have, if you open a process, it'll have all the settings in it that you just used. Um, so it's got the stretch I just did on that luminance image. Oh, one more thing. Don't forget to remove your masks. I forget to do this all the time, especially when I, when I turn it off. So I'm gonna hit remove. If, you, if you're processing your images and stuff just is not working or things are stretched, are looking really like not how you expect, make sure you have removed whatever mask you were using previously. All right, so with that being said, uh, I'm gonna hit the reset button here on histogram transformation. And just for protection, I'm gonna go ahead and select the image I actually wanna apply this to, which is gonna be um, yeah, three color cal, yeah. Okay, 
So um, I'm going to talk about the histogram just for a second. So as you can see, uh, in its linear state, all the data is scrunched up here at the very leftmost edge. I'm zooming in here by hovering over the, um, the scale button, here, the horizontal zoom button uh, in between the upper view, which is the current histogram, and the bottom window, which is any modifications you make to it. So I'm zooming in just by using my scroll wheel on that window. You can see that all the data is way down there at the bottom on our 16-bit wide histogram down here. So just like you would in Photoshop, let's zoom back out here. Yeah, what have I done? Where did you come from? Um, what did I do? <laughs> I clicked something. I don't know what's happening right now. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I was like zoomed in really weird on that axis. Okay. Um, so I'm going to take my midtone slider and I'm going to pull it all the way or pretty far over here to the left. And then I'm going to zoom in a bit so I can see. I'm going to pull it up. Oh, sorry. Um, hit the real-time preview button so you can see what you're doing because it's not going to show it to you on the main image. So real-time preview button is this open circle down here on the bottom. I'm going to pull this up. And just like with stretching in, in Photoshop or your other favorite image, image processing program, this is a multiple-step process. So I'm going to start by pulling that mid-tone slider back toward it. Hit apply. Now. Um, PixInsight is it, it does instead of doing single kind of layers type processes like Photoshop, it does these iterative processes. So if I um, if I hit the supply button again, it will apply the same action again, which is not what I want. As you can see, it's making the image super mega stretched. So you have to hit the reset button on that histogram every time you you change it so that you can get it back to kind of eight. So I can go ahead and move the black point up closer to the bottom of the histogram. Because I have background dust, I don't want to move it up. So I'd like to keep that, that the dim areas in there. And then I'm going to pull the mid-tone slider back up toward the histogram here. Hit apply, which is the square box. Hit reset. And do this a few more times until I start to get something that I like. Now, unfortunately, you can't really zoom in on this window. You can create a smaller preview and do the real-time preview off of that and then apply it to your overall image. So you're going to have to guess and check a little bit. But luckily, this is the fast process. If you want to undo a step, you can you right-click on the image you're applying it to on the little tab here on the left and just hit undo. All right. Um, how's that looking? Looking pretty close to where I want. I'm going to do some more messing with the histogram when I get to curves. All right, apply. All right, cool. Reset. Goodbye. Um, OK. For the sake of time, I'm going to skip uh, HDR multi-scale transform, which is uh, it, it does some really awesome uh, contrast enhancement, basically. Because you have to make a mask for a different kind of mask for it and stuff, and um, I'm already getting pretty close on time here. So let me just hop over to curves then. So all processes, curves transformation. This, if you've used Photoshop before, this is going to be a very familiar tool to you. Only it's got a whole lot more options. So instead of just red, green, blue, and uh, basically your, your luminance or your, all, all your channels, it also has alpha. Um, the lightness component, the A and B components, which I haven't really messed with, the C component, whatever that is, hue, and saturation is here too. There's another saturation tool that I'll, I'll briefly mention after this. So again, you have to use your real-time preview button in order to see what you're doing. I'm going to start with saturation. So again, your, your dark, the dark areas of your image are down here on the left. The light areas of your image are up here on the right, and the mid areas are here in the middle. If you're not so, as familiar with using histogram tools. Um, so in this case, I'm going to I'm pulling up the saturation of the midtones of the image, which is where I mostly want my colors to be a little bit enhanced. So I'm going to pull it up a bit. I'm going to hit apply. I'm going to look and make sure that it didn't do anything too funky. Yeah, that looks that looks real nice. Okay. 
I'm gonna hit reset because if I if I leave it if I don't change it, it'll it'll add that that change I made to the saturation over and over again as I as I go and change other things. So you have to hit that reset button before moving on. I'm gonna go to the RGB overall and just can I um, this is where I'm gonna make my S curve. So boost the midtones, drop the darks a bit, drop the lights a, or the highlights a bit. You know, get something that that I'm basically increasing the contrast here myself. Move that out of the way for a second. Yeah, so now I'm starting to reveal even more of the dust, uh, even some of the red that's coming up here uh, off of the Orion Nebula, um, some of the dark nebula that's going on over here. Um, I would get more of this if I did that HDR multi-scale transform, but I don't have time for that tonight. Um, let's see, reset that. In fact, I could maybe even, I don't want to go too crazy, but could maybe even tweak that just a little bit more. And, you know, maybe I'll bump up the reds a smidge and see what that does. Oh, that's too much. Maybe a little more up here. Oh, those reds are somewhere. Yeah, no, we're just going to not roll with that. Okay. All right, apply. Cool. Okay. So now we're getting pretty close to the end. So, um, shoot, I really wish I could show you the HDR thing. Uh, so there's there's a lot of tools, a lot there's so many tools in in Pix and Site. Um, with that, there's things like I mentioned, the HDR multiscale transform to um, to help increase contrast. But what it also does is it can pull pull back. This looks like it's saturated, but it's not as saturated as it looks. If we go to this is the image I processed earlier, including the HDR multiscale transform, I was able to actually get some more get some detail out of that seemingly too bright area because um, it is there it's just like finely separated layers of brightness that it has to kind of sneak out um, there's additional denoising tools like acdnr if uh, if you still have persistent noise that work really well on this non-linear data uh, there's some scripts like dark structure enhance that's really good for galaxies to kind of make those those dark areas of the galaxy stand out more the dust planes um, I think I actually ended up cropping this image a little bit more because I had a lot of vignetting in a couple of the corners. Yeah, so those are some of the, the basic tools to, to get started in PixInsight. There's a lot more. There's there's whole books written on this. I just got Warren Keller's Inside PixInsight, the new edition that I need to start diving into. Um, there's lots of websites and online tutorials, both paid and free out there, YouTube videos. And really, it's just a lot of experimentation. It was very overwhelming at first, but kind of I followed a couple of video tutorials and some written tutorials, and kind of started to get a feel for how PixInsight worked. And um, now I'm able to to create far better images than I was ever able to get using using um, Deep Sky Stacker and Photoshop. Like I would never have thought I, it was possible to get the amount of dark nebula and like the witch head nebula that I'm seeing here from a, a orange yellow Bortle zone with an unmodified DSLR. And that's the power of these really powerful image processing programs. And you just got to spend some time with it. You got to start messing around with the parameters. Um, see, there's always new stuff to learn. Um, there's a lot of different ways to do the same thing that can get you even more fantastic results and something you can spend a lot of time learning. That's why there's whole books written about it. Um, yeah, so that's the, that's the introduction, and hopefully it's a, it wasn't too much for people who are just getting started, but um, I think it's some good helpful tools to get you a good solid image out of, out of the majority of your data. Okay, thank you very much, Molly. We do have, I think, one question here from uh, NGC 1535. Um, uh, would you use HDRM? T, uh, I forget what that means. Yeah, HDR multi-scale transform. Yeah, multi-scale, yeah. Um, with a selective mask for a particular bit, or, or what would you do? Would you? Yeah, so so in that case, you're going to use a range mask, and that range mask is going to um, it's going to protect all the dark areas of your image, all of the non um, the non-target areas of your image, so that you can just focus on the target itself. Mm -hmm. um, 
Okay. Yeah. So yeah. So okay. we're going to create a range mask for that. And I think, and then we got a couple of people looking into uh, Warren's book and some uh, picks inside, inside picks inside. Um, well, we've got Ray. Ray, can you um, let's check your mic out on on mute you? Can you tell us a little bit about what's happening next week? Uh, yes, I'm going to be talking about PemPro V3 and uh, PemPro Log Viewer and uh, a few other utilities. Okay. Cool. Did it come through okay? Yeah, yeah. We're we're testing you also, so make okay. sure your equipment's working. Michaela's out there too. She's uh, signed in. Michaela, you got? Uh, can you say something? Tell us what you're going to be talking about. Yeah, I'm going to be talking about um, astrophotography for like a broke college student. So like kind of the cheap version, someone who can't afford like programs like Pix and Sight and stuff like so using GIMP and just cheap stuff to use. <laughs> Good, great. Um, as we said earlier, we've got a whole load of things um, planned for next month. We've still got March 24th open, but uh, after Ray and then Michaela, uh, we're going to hear uh, Ryan's going to tell us more about. Um, I think he's probably going to make up for all the mistakes I made last week talking, talking about polar alignment. And then Ron Brecher's coming in um, the week, uh, the end of the month, to tell us about. Um, uh, Pixel Math in Pix Insight, and uh, it's noted here that uh, over in the chat area, that Bracken's book uh, Astro Imaging Primer is coming out soon. Uh, a couple of people saying good work, Molly. Thank you very much. It's always a lot of fun to hear from new voices. Uh, yours is not exactly new because you've said things before. We do need more people, and I can tell you because I met Molly last. Was it just last year or the year before? at the Texas Star Party. It was last year, yeah. Yes, last year, wow. Yeah. And, <laughs> uh, you know, we all have something we can share. And I really wanna encourage you. It's not that hard to do. It's not that hard to sit here. Um, I'm in my living room, as you can see, uh, or family room, whatever I am. Uh, Molly's in, well, I don't know where, well, I don't know where everybody is, but we're just sitting here on the computer, trying to work through some things, giving you guys an opportunity to ask questions. We don't know all the answers. Luckily, we've got some people here that do know a lot of the answers. Some of them even know all the answers and they chime in as we go along. Um, don't be afraid to, to put your two cents worth in and uh, please uh, contact the Astro Imaging channel at that information. You can find our contact information on the website. And um, please, we need presenters. So do your thing, you know, chip in uh, this station, this channel, is all the more better for all the people that help on it. And on that, I want to thank Molly again, invite y'all back for next week. So um, come on back, okay? Thank you, bye-bye. Good night.